today is found in Galatians chapter 1, if you have your Bible to you. Welcome back to many of those who have been with us for a long time. We'll just sit back here. Maraming mga balikbayan. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1, actually the whole chapter. As you are turning your Bibles or your Bible apps, Sabi nila, 13 is a bad luck number. But to us, and primarily because we're believers, but to us primarily, uh, this, this 13th day of January marks my 29th year of marriage. And also the birthday of my wife. Para isang regalo lang po yun. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 to following, to the whole chapter, to save that, I'll just be reading some portion, and uh, as we go along, I'll be reading uh, the whole passages. Galatians chapter 1, reading from New American Standard Bible, it says in verse 1, Galatians chapter 1, Paul an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. <coughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from, the, from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Verse 6. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be a curse. For, for, am, for am, am, now, am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bond. For I would have you know, or I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we submit to you this time as we continue to worship you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to, to continue to illumine our minds and make these words that we are going to hear be a word to us in whatever situations we are in life today. We bless you, we honor you, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for the next months, I think for the next uh, 24 months, we will be going through deep study of the covenant in relation to, in relation to all our lives. Covenant and the gospel are in common, or may I say, are one because they both tell us the truth that we belong to God. So if you talk about the difference between the two, te technically, they have no difference. They are actually in common because they both tell us the truth that we belong to God. Now, for us to have a good understanding of the letter of Paul to Galatians, particularly chapter 1, as we're going to study chapter 1, I'd like for us to think of these following questions. What do we do when we've made a mess of things? Or where do we go when we've blown it badly? To what do we turn when we embittered our child with harsh words? When we betrayed our spouse with sheer stupidity? 
when we've driven a wedge between friends or sown discord among our people in the congregation? Where do we go when we've been insensitive, thoughtless, or offensive? How do we respond and when, we, when we've drifted away from the faith, compromised the gospel, or turn our back on God. Now, typically, when we sin, we like to hide. Either our sin, or ourselves, or both. Tinatago natin yung sarili natin, yung ginagawa natin, or we both hide those things. Now, this is a natural response. Hardwired into our genes. From our forefathers, Adam and Eve. Naalala nyo? We get this instinct from our first parents, Adam and Eve. When they sin, they hid. And we can read that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. Naalala ko, uh, Pastor Doy keep on joking that uh, it was Adam and Eve who actually invented the game Hide and Seek. So, Adam and Eve, when, when they sin, they hid. And humanity has been hiding ever since, right? When the believers in Galatia first heard the letter of Paul and his rebuke read aloud, they too, as we can read, no doubt, wanted to run and hide. They turned their faith inside out and upside down, that's what happens when we turn our back on grace and seek to be justified by the law. After fall, Paul left Galatia. The Galatian believers came under the influence of certain individuals who discredited Paul's apostleship. They called into question the validity of the gospel and insisted that Galatian believers were only half big and needed to go all the way and get circumcised if they were going to shore up their status as children of God. These Judaizers, as they were commonly called, were apparently quite effective in persuading the Galatians of the necessity of circumcision, if not the need to embrace the Jewish law as a whole. Of course, they could have drawn on the powerful arguments to commend the law to the Galatian Christians. And, and as a result, the believers developed misgivings about whether Paul had told them the whole story or whether his gospel could get them to where they needed to go spiritually. Thus, they were suffering from a bad case of almost like a backsliding the upshot of which was to turn away from the one who called them in the grace of Christ and turn to a different gospel, the one the Judaizers preach. Well, some of us find ourselves in a similar situation with the Galatians or with, with the believers in Galatians. We embrace the gospel with a great enthusiasm at first, but we find that living the Christian life isn't what we expected. As a result, we too wrestle sometimes wondering and wondering whether something is more needed to get us where we want to go in life. Now this is where the Galatians were, which is why Paul's very word to them is to insist the message of the gospel still Stands. And as it was true to them, and true even to us today, like Paul was saying, that the message of the gospel stands. It will not change. It cannot be changed. It will stand. It stands. What do we learn and what can we learn from the passage about the message of the gospel? And what does this relate? Or how does this relate to us? There are three things. Number one, 
We have the gospel message that is faithful and true. We have the gospel message that is faithful and true. We can read that in verses 1 and 1 and 2, also in verses 6 to 12. I will not be reading this because we read that a while ago. Now, what was Paul talking in verse 1 particularly, uh, as we go along, what he was talking in verse uh, 6 to 12 particularly, if you, read, if you read through, was actually the same thing. He was talking about Jesus Christ and the gospel. He was actually talking of one thing, of the same thing. And you can read in verses 6 to 12 that the word gospel was mentioned about five times repeatedly. Now, the word gospel in the original language is equivalent now in our English words as good news. Euangelion, good news. That's why when we talk about the gospel, its character being good news must be faithful and true. Right? The gospel being, being good news must be faithful and true. But at the same time, the passage tells us why the gospel message is faithful and true. The gospel message is faithful and true because of the following. One, it's about God's calling us to Him by the grace of Christ. The question is, are we worthy of that calling? Are we worthy of that calling? If we have understood how this calling was made possible by grace, it would seem impossible to be true. All of us have stories about how we encounter our Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel. God called us to Him. And His primary reason for calling us to Him was not our qualifications, or else we will, all of us will be disqualified. His one reason of calling us to Him was simply and only His love for us. That's why God's calling us to Him is grace, and it is true. Sometimes it's hard to understand, but it is grace, and it is true. Also, the gospel is faithful and true because it is about Jesus Christ who died and rose again from the dead. That's what he said in verse 1. Kagina, in the 7 o'clock, uh, I was glad to hear the song, you know, uh, ko yung title, but this is how the song goes. It says, How can it be, and can it be, that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain, for me who Him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be, that Thou, my God, should die for me? It may be hard to believe that sinner as we are, but he died for me and for you. All because of his amazing grace. Also, the message of the gospel is faithful and true because it is the only gospel, as is said in verses 6 to 12. Meaning, there can only be the gospel and it is called there can only be one gospel, and it is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing more. There's no other gospel. There's only the gospel of Christ. Nothing more. That's why Paul is saying there can never be a different gospel. Meaning, either of another of the same kind or another of different kind. Today, we're very familiar of what we call imitation. And surprisingly, imitation boasts of being almost like the original. Diba? Punta kayo dyan sa malapit lang sa atin. Marami dyang original. Mamili kayo. Class A, AAA, AAAA. Diba? They boast of almost like the original. But no matter how we describe it, imitation is not the one. It's not the one. There can only be one gospel, and it is called the gospel of Christ. Nothing more. 
Sometimes we gain more advantage if the principle will come from the general knowledge. Because as we learn in philosophy, philosophy will agree that when we talk about the truth, truth can only be absolute and cannot be relative. The message of the gospel is truth and nothing but the truth. In fact, if we read true, it says to us, there can never be another gospel even it comes from an angel from heaven. So there will be claims about people who have contact with angels or they are angels themselves, but it cannot be the gospel. Apostles nor angels can never replace or duplicate the gospel. Because in the end, as what Paul was saying, it is not according to men, nor from men. You see, the certainty of our message, the reason why we can hold on to our faith, is the truth that our message is divinely inspired. And is, and is consistent in its entirety in the whole scripture. Because the whole message of scripture tells us that it is what God has said. The entirety of the scripture tells us it is what God has said. Or because God says so. That's why when we talk about the gospel message in our daily life, in our daily life, it's actually the word of God. And as we hear and encounter messages every day coming from different sources, that's not only discouraging to hear, but also hurting and many times makes us weak, we must turn our ears and focus our faith to the Word of God where words will definitely be faithful and true. Well, due to many things that we hear today that are so disturbing, news and uh, many things that we hear, due to what we hear about, what people say about us or against us, and because we fill our minds with all the things that we hear, plus the fact that out of all these things, we make wrong conclusions, we make ourselves an easy target of our enemies. Satan, don't. Don't. That's why to us, what God has said is more important than what we hear or even what anyone has said or would say to us. We have the gospel message that is faithful and true and it is the truth and nothing but the truth. Second, we have the gospel message that is, that is able to provide us for us, grace and peace from God. That's in verse 3 to 5. It's very short. I read this. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from, his present, from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, what is, what is the importance of grace and peace for us? Especially in our relationship with God and in our in, 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 as we go through all of this life, well, as we, as we look and as we have studied in the Bible, grace and peace made a way for us to gain an access to God. We cannot talk about even a hint of our relationship with God without His grace and peace. You see, we all exist for and because of grace. We all exist for and because of grace. In fact, grace is what was needed for us to be able to be loved by God. We're so unlovable because of sin. Each one of us begins and ends with grace. That's why grace is called unmerited favor. Because of sin, we have no ability whatsoever that we can connect to God. 
Kahit ano gawin natin, we cannot, we don't have that ability to connect to God. And no amount of our works can be acceptable to God. Because the Bible clearly says, uh, all have seen and fall short of the glory of God. We, we always fall short of the glory of God. And even if we are to think of it, we ask, how much of good works is needed for us to be accepted by God? Then, if we are to talk about cost and amount, who could ever be accepted? But only those who are able, right? That's why when we talk about grace, it is not about what we have done or what we can do or even any amount of good works that we have accomplished all our lives. Knowing, the Bible clearly said, that all our good works are just filthy rugs before God. So what can we present to God? Nothing. Nothing. So when we talk about grace, it is only what He has done for us and nothing about us. Nothing about us. Always remember that grace is unmerited, but at the same time, undeserved. Barclay says, one of uh, an old commentator and also a minister of the word, he says in this regard, the basic fact behind Paul's gospel was a gospel of free grace. He believed with all his heart that nothing a man could do could ever earn the love of God. And that therefore all a man could do was fling himself on his mercy in an act of faith. All a man could do was to take in wondering gratitude what God offered. The important thing was not what we could do for ourselves, but what he has done for us. What is grace actually telling us to do is really a response of gratitude. That's what grace is telling us to do. A response of gratitude. Meaning, everything that we do for God should be an act of gratitude and not to gain favor from God. Pupunta ko sa church, I will serve the Lord because I want to be blessed. Everything that we do to God, for God, should be an act of gratitude and not an act to gain favor from God. Actually, that's only a bonus. And I would like to say that the highest form of service and worship is really a demonstration of gratitude. You know why? Because when gratitude is demonstrated, it's priceless. And sometimes it is sacrificial. That's why David testified and said, I will not offer anything to God that cost me nothing. I remember a poem which says these words, and title niya is Leftovers. Ang sabi don, Leftovers are such humble things. We would not serve them to a guest, and yet we serve them to our Lord. Tama ba yun? Yung leftovers, we would not serve them to a guest. Do you serve leftovers to a guest? Sometimes. Pero, we serve them to our Lord. Who deserve the very best. We give to Him leftover time, stray minutes here and there. Leftover cash, we give to Him. Such few coins, we give to Him. We can spare, as we can spare. We give our youth unto the world to hatred, lust, and strife, then in declining years, we give to Him the remnant of our lives. Tira-tira na lang ang sa Lord. Again, I say, when gratitude is demonstrated, it is sometimes, it is priceless and many times sacrificial. We're all undeserving. Do you agree with me? We're all undeserving. But now we know, sinner as we are, praise and thank God that by the grace of God, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. 
Not only that, when we talk about grace, you know, the Greek word for grace, which is charis or charis, which means grace in the theological sense, but also it means beauty and charm. So when you talk about grace, you also talk about beauty and charm. And even when theologically used, the idea of charm is never far away from it. Because if the Christian life has grace in it, it must be a lovely and beautiful thing. Meaning, it is in beauty that grace is seen. So, this is the beauty of what it is to be in Christ. It means for us that although undeserved, we can speak of beauty in life, both in, in our lives and in our experiences, that even in the midst of this dark and cruel world, life will be made beautiful every day because of the grace of God. Knowing fully well that God is in control and in business of making and putting all forms of beauty in our lives all by His grace. Remember this, my brothers and sisters. God applied grace so we can be beautiful before Him, inside and out. And He supplied us with grace so that life will be made beautiful every day. At the same time, other than the provision of grace, we also have peace, the provision of peace. And peace was needed for us so that we can be accepted and remove the wrath from us. Now bear in mind that sin not only separated us from God. Because of sin, we do not have peace with God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 5 verse 8 to 11 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Verse 11, And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. By having peace with God, the Bible is saying, we are now reconciled with God. What separates us from God is now removed. No more. That's, not, that's why now we can say there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And now, it is this peace with God that in the midst of fears and anxieties, the Bible says, it is His peace that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It is this peace with God that even if we're surrounded with enemies, the Bible says, God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? None. For we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. It is this peace with God that now we can believe that even though we, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Remember his name, Emmanuel. That's peace. Because Emmanuel means God with us. So now we have grace and peace from God. We have, we have peace with God, with God. And because we have peace, peace with God, there's now no limit of what God can do for us. Do you believe that? Because now we have peace from God and we have peace with God, there's now no limit of what God can do for us. That's why we now can say, nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? Mukhang di kayo naniniwala. Naniniwala ba kayo doon? 
Because now we have peace with God. We can truly claim that nothing is impossible with God. There's now no limit of what God can do for us. And so now we have grace and peace from God. While we are still and will face so much difficulties every day, that's reality. We cannot change that reality. But we can rely on God for there will always be grace and peace that, will, that God will provide for us for our daily needs. And for sure, we will, He will never run out of supply of grace and peace. As we think of many days and years that pass, sometimes we wonder how we were able to make it. Have you, have you thought of that? Paano nalagpasan yun? For all we know, it is His grace and peace all along. We have the gospel message that is able to provide for us grace and peace from God. Thirdly and lastly, we have the gospel message that gave us opportunity to please God and bless others. I'll be reading verses 10 to 24. We have the gospel message that gave us opportunity to please God and bless others. It says in verse 10 to 24, For I am not seeking the favor of men or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. For I would have no brethren that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. For I neither received it from men, nor, I was, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous of my ancestral traditions. But when God, who has set me apart even from a mother's womb and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go out to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. I, uh, then I went into regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the, to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, who, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Well, clearly, Paul in this passage was talking about his life, how his life was changed. But, but how do we know his life was changed? Well, his life was changed no other than by the gospel message. That's why he testified. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Because as we, as we read through, Paul's life was used to be all about displacing God. Ano yung ginagawa ni Paul? Ano yung ginagawa niya? Ano yung ginawa niya to the churches? His primary goal was to persecute the church. In fact, ang description doon is uh, to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. So his life, all his life was, to, was about displacing God. But because Paul had a personal encounter with the gospel, his life was changed like never before. And as we read his words, his gratitude to God for what happened in his life made him to look at his life as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. The persecutor now serving, was now serving no longer for his own, but for the Lord. And like Paul, we are also made to become bond servant of Christ. Pero ano ba yung pagiging bond servant? What was Paul saying about becoming a bond servant? And how is this related to us? Well, it tells us, you know, when we are bond servant, we are made to be bond servant. It tells us that our commitment to Jesus, our commitment is to Jesus Christ alone. 
Our commitment is to Jesus Christ alone. Do you know what's the difference between a slave and a servant or a bond servant? Well, a slave served his master for a duration of time. Especially, pag natapos na yung sabbatical year, he can make himself free. Or his master can make himself, can make him free. On the other hand, uh, being a slave, you, you have no right of your own. And in fact, a slave, you don't own nothing, even yourself. But a slave becomes a bond servant when he set aside his freedom in order to give his whole life for his master. That's why for us today, being bond servant, our service is a commitment to Jesus Christ alone. That is, all our lives are now for our master. Which makes the center of our work and our worship is none other than Christ alone. Well, you have already heard these words repeatedly, but this is what should characterize our lives today. Our work, our worship, and our worship, our work. All our lives should be characterized by worshiping God. Commitment. That is our commitment. Also, it tells us about a special bond of relationship. We now live to serve for the purpose of the Master. Well, sin made our lives meaningless. But for us today, we live today for the purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's about serving God with the highest purpose of giving Him glory. What, what Paul did say in verse 24. And they were glorifying God because of me. They were glorifying God because of me. Paul, who was before a self-seeking, now seeking to save the lost. Paul wants to be a destroyer of lives. Now, he's a blessing to many. That's why when you talk about blessing others, we always think of others and less of ourselves. Now this I'll share for the glory of God. All I have are God's blessing. I suppose the same with you. And I also thank God that I have, read, I have reached this, this far in my life because God used others to bless me also. That's why I'm standing here in front of you as a recipient of God's blessing. That's why other than I gave my life to God, I always remember to share His blessing. Now I see many believers today, especially young, young pro, or maybe uh, the, the 40s below, or maybe all of us na lang, or the millennials today, Alam niyo bang millennials today? They're very good in saving money and wise spending. Tama ba yan? Huh? The millennials today are very good in, in saving money. But at the same time, wise spending. On the other hand, lest we forget, in being a blessing to others, you have to learn what it is to be a cheerful giver. Nawawala na yung mga generations of giver. Those who are willing to bless others. But also, if we talk about blessing others, we should not forget that others means our family. Our family. Meaning, we do not forget our family. That's why when, when we talk about 
covenant family and service to God, we think of our family as our primary ministry. We cannot talk about service, commitment, and set aside our family. In fact, in the olden times, the servant does not separate his life from his family. Meaning, if he's a servant, his whole family becomes servants also. He serves along with his family. The Bible says, neglecting our family makes us worse than unbelievers, an unbeliever. That's why when we talk about covenant family, it's about seeing to it that everyone in the family, other than given, given with the right care and attention, our family is to be growing with us and increasingly serving with us and loving God with us. On the other hand, whether or not we were able to bring our family to the church, well, to see them as our primary ministry means we do not neglect them. Instead, we show to them a good testimony and a good example. How are we being an example and a good testimony in our family? At the same time, praying that Acts 16.31 will be realized in your family. What is Acts 16.31? Are you concerned with your family? So what is Acts 16.31? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And when this realized, then all together we can say, as Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, I believe as we talk about covenant family, we keep in mind our family is the primary ministry. Meaning we serve the Lord by not neglecting our family in bringing them closer to the Lord at all and by, by all means. At all costs and by all means. We are all to live now serving Him with all our hearts. All for the glory of God. We have the gospel message that gave us opportunity to please God and bless others. In summary, we, we learned three things. Uh, can you all read the summary? Let's read. We have the gospel message that is faithful and true. It is the truth and nothing but the truth. Second, we have the gospel message that is able to provide for us grace and peace from God. Now, there's no limit of what God can do for us. And third, we have the gospel message that gave us opportunity to please God and bless others. God gave meaning into our lives and now we're, we're not just pleasing God, but we also can bless others through our lives. We have the, the gospel message, and that stands. We can hold on to it. We can grow into it. We can be a blessing to others through it. The power of the message of the gospel changed our lives and mine, yours and mine's. And it, it, its powers continues to change our lives for the better, for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we are reminded of the message that we have received from you. It is the message that now that puts us to you in Christ. That we now can approach you, your throne of grace with confidence. And we thank you for now we can enjoy our fellowship with you. That every day of our lives can be made beautiful because of you, because of the grace you have given to us through the gospel, through Jesus Christ. Though we go through many things in life, we are hurt, we go through different needs and situations, grace will find a way for us and will make our lives, our situations better and beautiful in God's hands. Thank you, Father God, for your truth. And your truth will remain. May we grow on it, hold on to it, and be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name.
Amen.